Bonsoir. Good evening. Nous vous remercions de votre présence à cette réunion de consultation publique sur la modification du zonage et des règlements 2474 et 2217 pour le projet des Jardins Westminster proposé par Claria Development sur le site situé à l'angle de l'avenue Westminster et du chemin Mackle. Thank you for attending this public consultation meeting on the zoning and bylaw amendment for bylaws 2474 and 2217 for the Jardin Westminster project proposed by Claria Development on the site at the corner of Westminster Avenue and Mackle Road. Today is Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023. The meeting is being video recorded in the council chamber at the city of Côte St. Luke. Je m'appelle Tania Abramovic, je suis la directrice générale associée de la ville de côte saint et je vais présenter les intervenants et expliquer le déroulement de l'Assemblée. The objective of this session is to provide you with the information on the proposed project Les Jardins Westminster, to inform you about the legal process that surrounds it and to answer questions and receive comments. The session is scheduled from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Voici l'ordre du jour de cette Assemblée de consultation. Nous commencerons par le discours d'ouverture de conseiller Mitch Kujawski, qui tient le portfolio de l'aménagement urbain. We will start with a few words from Councillor Kujawski, who holds the portfolio for urban planning. The developers will then be given an opportunity to present their project to the public. Ensuite, il y aura une présentation des promoteurs du projet. This will be followed by a presentation from Patrick Awad from Urban Planning about the zoning amendment and adoption process in addition to the referendum approval process. Ensuite, Patrick Awad de la division de l'aménagement urbain va présenter le processus de l'adoption de la modification de zonage et du processus d'approbation référendaire. Finally, we will have a question and answer period. Enfin, il y aura une période de questions et de réponses. In addition to the persons mentioned, we are also joined by Charles Senecal, Director of Urban Development, Maître Pascali Tanguy from the legal department, Melanie Rothpan, Urban Planning Coordinator, and Florine Agbonu is the assistance graphique who is taking the notes tonight. Um, and also we have the developers and their representatives present. The public will be able to ask questions or make comments during the designated period. Questions should be short and clear in order to give everyone an opportunity to speak. We ask that you remain respectful in your questions and derogatory remarks will of course not be tolerated. Nous ferons notre mieux de répondre à un maximum de questions tout au long de la session. Faites en sorte que vos questions soient courtes et claires afin de donner à chacun la possibilité de s'exprimer. Nous vous demandons de rester respectueux et les commentaires dérogatoires ne seront pas tolérés. This meeting will be video, video recorded and will be posted on the CoteStLuke.org slash engage website this week, tomorrow. Um, cette réunion fait l'objet d'un enregistrement vidéo qui sera publié cette semaine sur notre site web cotesenuc.org slash contribuer. This ends the preliminary remarks. I will now ask Councillor Kujawski to make introductory comments. Thank you, Tanya. I'll be very brief. Um, welcome to you all. My name is Mitch Kujawski. I'm the City Councillor for District 5 and Portfolio Holder of Urban Planning and Engineering. Uh, welcome. It's nice to see many people here. Citizen, citizen engagement is, uh, is important, so it's, it's nice to see a lot of people uh, come to public consultations uh, of this nature. Welcome to my fellow members of council. I see Stephen, Andy, do I see others? Lior, Lior, where are you, Lior? Hi, Lior. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is not my show, so uh, I will pass the mic immediately to the developers, but thank you all for coming, and, uh, and I hope you have all your questions and concerns answered. Thank you. Well, thank you, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to share this exciting project that will have a great impact in this neighborhood. My colleague, Renee, and I will be presenting for the following 10 minutes, and we're going to follow with the Q&A. And the idea is that I trust that at the end of this presentation, you will have a clear understanding of the entire project and have the answers to all of yours and the city council's questions. But before that, let me introduce the team, the who we are. So for those of you that do not know my partner, Michael Dadoon, he's present here tonight. Michael, a bit of his background, is a successful entrepreneur that spent the, most of his career, I'd say, in the tech industry. And about 10 years ago, Michael started a real estate development company, same owners of the Equinox project on Marc Chagall, which is a beautiful state-of-the-art luxury apartment building of over 320 units, which is fully rented today. 
From a community standpoint, Michael spends over 30% of his time giving back to the community, sharing committees, chairing committees, as well as being on multiple boards. All of this, of course, as a volunteer. Michael spent most of his schooling in Cote Saint Luc, just a few minutes away from here. For myself, my name is Avi Crispin, and I grew up in Cote Saint Luc, lived most of my life a few blocks away from here. My parents are still living here. Uh, fun fact, um, I actually received the Save a Life Award when I was at the age of 16 from the city of Cote Saint Luc, being at the right place, right time, uh, had the, the honor of saving someone's life at the Cavendish Mall. Uh, from a community standpoint, I spent about 20% of my time giving back to the community, president of a couple of committees and boards. From a career front, I spent the last 25 years in the real estate industry and acted as an executive for the last 10 of these years. So Michael and I are co-founders of Claria, and thanks to our reputations, we managed to quickly gain market share. We are known for our values, integrity, trust, knowledge. This is just to mention a few. And we are in the business of moving lives versus building new homes. So when acting this way, your entire approach in business becomes your competitive advantage. In other words, people invest in us before investing in our projects. Now, you have a better understanding of who we are. Here's our project timeline to put all the individuals here present tonight into context. Since we submitted our first version of the project to the city in 2019, four years ago, here's a timeline of the major reports and studies provided by Claria at the request of the advisory committee, the councillors, and the city of Cote Saint Luc. Hence why we feel confident that tonight is a great opportunity to close the loop on all the questions that were outstanding. So please take a look at the screen. I know it's very small, but I'm gonna say, give you the big lines. Three public consultations, including today's. Eight architecture plan modifications. Four meetings with the advisory committee of Cote Saint Luc. Five traffic studies. Two waste management studies. And one sound and vibration study. All of this was done in collaboration with the city in order to deliver the best possible outcome for this beautiful project. Over and beyond that, we invited all of the experts that worked on these said reports, and they are here present tonight to answer any of your questions. So without further ado, let me introduce you to my colleague Rene, which is the Vice President of Development and Construction for Claria. Over to you. Thanks, Avi. So let's look at the site plan. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? yeah? OK. So we, we named our project Westminster Garden, Les Jardins Westminster. And this is exactly the idea we had, to create a garden and to have the two buildings surround that garden. So in terms of landscaping, there's a lot being done. The project is really designed around a beautiful interior courtyard that will be accessible to the public. We are planting 80 new trees. Uh, most of the existing trees on Mackle and on Westminster are gonna be kept in place. We're gonna be installing green roofs on our lower roofs. Um, also, there, there's gonna be a two meter high uh, landscaped mound along the railways that will act as a security, visual, and sound barrier. And along the townhouses on the right side of the project, we're also planting trees to ensure their privacy. Now, in terms of height and density, the current zoning allows for a six-story building. So theoretically, we could be building a solid block of six floors on the site. But our strategy here was rather to set back the higher volumes towards the back of the site, uh, and then at the street level to maintain the neighborhood housing height uh, so that it respects the urban fabric of the area. Donc, l'augmentation de la densité, elle se fait graduellement par palier vers le fond du terrain. Euh, on a une gradation pour s'intégrer à l'environnement existant, c'est-à-dire que la portion sur la rue du côté Mako, elle est basse, comme les maisons avoisinantes, et l'augmentation de la hauteur se fait graduellement vers le fond du terrain. So, this density setback has, in fact, many benefits. Um, it allows to free up some space on the ground to create landscaped areas, and in our case, it's going to be a beautiful courtyard. And in an urban environment, it's, it's definitely an added value. Also for the neighborhood, uh, 
we're going to create uh, with the project a visual sound and security screen in front of the rail yard. And then for the project itself, it will allow us to create an additional offer about 120 units versus the actual zoning. And we've decided that these uh, 125, uh, 120 units, 75% of those would be for families. So two to four bedrooms per unit. Et dans le contexte actuel uh, de pénurie de logements familiaux qu'on connaît tous, uh, je pense que c'est très bénéfique pour une ville d'avoir cette carte en main. Donc le projet est bénéfique pour le voisinage parce qu'il va améliorer l'environnement urbain local et pour la ville grâce à une offre supplémentaire de logements familiaux. So let's look at a few images. Uh, so this is a view from Mako. We can see that uh, the higher levels are set back and at the ground, at the first plan of, uh, of the building, it's a two-story building that aligns with the height of the houses around it. And if you look at the next one on Rand, you see more or less the same thing. Uh, now, in terms of mobility in the, neighbor, in the neighborhood, I know this is a, a, an important issue, specifically traffic. I can tell you that the impact on local traffic will be very minimal, and you'll be able to talk to our uh, specialist after. <coughs> the network currently has enough capacity to accommodate the additional trips that are going to be generated by the project. What this means in terms of numbers is that there will be around 60 additional vehicles per hour during rush hour. Uh, this means one vehicle per minute additional. Donc, 60 vehicles per hour aux heures de pointe supplémentaires qui sont générées par ce projet, c'est un vehicle par minute. Donc, c'est vraiment négligeable. Now, in terms of parking, two things. First of all, our project will have 300 spaces of underground parking for our residents. The current ratio in Cote Saint-Luc is 1.25 vehicle per household. So our 300 places will cover 100% of the demand for our residents. We also have 10 exterior parking for the guests. And secondly, in terms of street parking, the current supply largely exceeds the demand. I think there's only about 10% of the spaces that are actually occupied on the streets right now in the area. So the impact will be minimal and the supply will still be superior to the demand. Donc, en bref, le projet va avoir un impact négligeable autant sur la circulation que sur le stationnement dans un rayon de 150 mètres du projet. The last item I want to touch on is the proximity to the rail yard. There's been a few concerns on that issue, and I, I want to address this because there is, in fact, no real reason for concern. There are two regulations related to the rail yards, and they address sound and vibration. So let's get a little technical here. When a residential building is within 75 meters of the right of way of a rail yard, the level of vibration should not exceed 0.14 millimeters per second inside the building. Number two, when a re residential building is within 300 meter of the right of, a, of right of way of a rail yard, the sound levels should not exceed 40 dB so 40 decibels inside the building and 55 dB, 55 decibels outside of the building. And by the way, this sound regulation is general for all residential projects. It doesn't apply only to projects that are closer to rail yards. So these levels have been evaluated uh, in our case through a regulatory 24-hour sound and vibration study which in our case was done by a very well-known firm in our industry. And the results show that the outside 55 dB is already respected on our site. And as for the two other regulations, we are also pretty much on the ball. But this is really standard procedure. 
we do these sound and vibration studies on all of our new developments, whether it's a city requirement or not, and, and regardless of the proximity to the railway. These studies are necessary to help us determine the type of soundproofing materials and the thickness uh, we're going to use when we're building our exterior walls in a project, when we're selecting uh, the types of windows we're going to use, and even when we're deciding the type of foundations on our buildings to ensure that we don't exceed the vibration levels. So these recommendations on material are part of the sound and vibration report uh, that is issued, and we have to make sure that we implement them during construction. So, vous savez, en tant que propriétaire à long terme de ces immeubles, on veut construire des bâtiments de qualité qui respectent les normes. Et c'est vraiment dans notre intérêt de faire ça, parce qu'au final, si, si les locataires ne sont pas satisfaits, l'immeuble est vide et on est les seuls perdants euh, de, de tout ça. We're going to come back to the map just before, because the, um, the actual uh, purple wasn't necessarily connected to the appropriate. Uh, there was just a little disconnect, so we'll go over it in a couple minutes. But in terms of the comp contribution to the community, uh, obviously we're talking about quality residence and multi-generational offer. So creation of high quality building construction, rental, and high-end condos. The city suggested that we make the area as urban as we can, and we listened. We are creating an urban lifestyle that would benefit not only the residents of this project, but the entire area. And the view you see here is from Westminster and Mackle. Also, at the request of the city, um, we, were, uh, we are going to be having about 5,100 square feet of retail space on the ground floor. And the city has shared a list of authorized businesses that will obviously be complementary beneficial to the area for the local community. Lastly, I had a conversation with a couple of different mayors, different boroughs, uh, within the last couple of weeks, and I just wanted to pick their brain, and I said, you know, what's making you sleep these days? And they were like, you know, we always have, uh, you know, residents coming up and saying, why are we having so many tax escalations, increases, and so forth? But on the flip side, you know, we're always constantly being challenged every time we wanted, you know, to develop or, or have developments in the area. And, and the answer to this is really, we need to encourage and promote developments in the area. So, and because in a nutshell, the reality is, is that the added value for this neighborhood is an investment of over $85 million. And this is for Côte Saint-Luc per se, increase in municipal taxes revenue. And this is over the million dollar mark if it were to be built today. There is a creation of housing offer in a context of rental shortage at the local level. And more importantly, where our kids are gonna go? Where are they gonna live? Right, so retention of Côte Saint Luc's populations, grandparents, parents, kids, and so forth. So on this note, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and we now welcome all your questions. Cool. We have a question period for the questions. Sorry, sorry about that. Now we're going to pass um, the presentation to Patrick from Urban Planning to talk about the process that will follow tonight's um, session. Hi everyone, my name is Patrick. Uh, I work in the urban planning department here at the city of Cote St. Luke. Um, so to just to begin, um, for the project that was uh, presented to you just now, uh, in order for it to be authorized to be built in the city of Cote St. Luke, uh, a zoning and master plan amendment is, would be required. Um, so this is a map uh, on the screen here of the uh, current area that the project is, uh, is proposed in. Uh, the gray area represents the two uh, current zones uh, over which the project would uh, occupy. Uh, and the surrounding zones, uh, RU42 and RU43, are the contiguous zones. Uh, the current zoning uh, is for zones RM60 and RU star 62, which were uh, on the previous slide. I can go back to it afterwards. Uh, so the current zoning allows for, in RM60, uh, two-family dwellings, uh, detached or semi-detached, or multifamily dwellings from three to four stories, uh, uh, three to five stories, sorry, my mistake. Uh, and uh, furthermore, it's currently authorized on the CP side that part of the building, <coughs> approximately 30%, has six stories. For zone RU, six, uh, RU star 62, Single family dwellings only are authorized uh, in rows 
and of maximum two stories. Uh, as for the uh, zoning modification approval process, uh, so as I mentioned, in order for the project to take place, uh, uh, there first needs to be a modification of the master plan, uh, which is a planning document that's, uh, that the zoning, uh, that the zoning bylaw basically comes from. Uh, following that, uh, at the uh, at a public council meeting, uh, the, which took place on the 13th of February, 2023, uh, there was a, a motion and adoption of a first draft of this amendment. And today we are at the public consultation, which is the following step uh, to, hear your, uh, to hear your concerns about the project. At the following council meeting, uh, which will take place on April 18th, uh, and that should read 2023, not 2022. The second draft will be uh, adopted by council. And after this step, uh, the referendum process will begin, uh, which will last approximately one to four months. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So for the referendum approval process, uh, following the second reading uh, at the next council on April 18th, um, a public notice will be posted uh, uh, regarding the, the uh, referendum process. If uh, a, a request for referendum, if requests for referendums uh, um, come from the contiguous zones, which I showed you on the first slide, uh, then there is a resolution and an opening of a registry uh, for which another public notice will be published uh, informing people that there is a registry that is being held and that they can sign as part of this process. Uh, this, the signatures must come from the contiguous zones, which I showed you. Uh, following the opening of the registry, uh, 74 signatures are required uh, in order for uh, the, the zoning amendment to be withdrawn. Uh, if there is less than uh, 74 signatures, the bylaw comes into effect. Can you define the, the, the boundaries of the contiguous zones, please? There's gonna be a question period afterwards, but I, I uh, promised I would go back to that slide to just show you. Uh, so the contiguous zones, as I mentioned earlier, were RU42 and RU43. You can see the boundaries in purple on the, on the plan. And RB12, my apologies, and CD6 as well. So if, uh, if you live in one of these contiguous zones, you are eligible to sign the registry. So uh, if, if there's nothing else, I'll open it up to uh, my colleague, Tanya, who will introduce the question period. Okay, so um, as you entered, the people who had questions, they were given numbers if they had, Daryl, a question. So if the person who has number one, please stand up and take the microphone. Anything being recorded, we can't hear it unless it's said into a microphone. Bonsoir tout le monde. <coughs> D'abord, je voudrais féliciter euh, tous les professionnels présents ici, les conseillers municipaux, le maire, pour euh, tout le travail qui a été accompli jusqu'à date. Et c'est remarquable parce que, grâce à Dieu, les choses se passent dans l'harmonie et la collaboration. Je suis le rabbin de la synagogue qui est juste en face, sur Westminster, du centre Breslev. Et également, je représente l'Académie Avené, qui est propriétaire maintenant du petit centre d'achat qui est juste à côté. Euh, aussi de côté adjacent. Mon implication dans ce dossier, c'est pour voir cette zone que j'appellerais plus ou moins sinistrée, reprendre un peu de vitalité et la voir boomer. Notre communauté grandit, bon, grâce à Dieu, nous avons des, des, que des bonnes choses et nous amenons évidemment une plus-value. Ça fait 50 ans que j'habite à Côte-Saint-Luc et nous avons participé à énormément de projets euh, à Côte-Saint-Luc dont nous sommes très fiers d'avoir contribué à la vie euh, générale. Aujourd'hui, ce que je vois ici, c'est mon petit avis simple, c'est une solution qui est gagnante pour tout le monde. C'est revitaliser une zone de Côte-Saint-Luc qui est dans un état lamentable, là je crois que c'est la pire zone, et euh, qui va permettre de véritablement donner de la valeur à toutes les maisons tout autour, d'avoir euh, un, un projet qui est très beau et qui va surtout stimuler d'autres engagements. Comme par exemple, notre synagogue, nous avons l'intention de faire quelque chose de plus beau, pas plus grand, mais plus beau, et, euh, et nous voyons au contraire ça d'un très très bon oeil de pouvoir voir cet essor et cet épanouissement. Le petit centre d'achat aussi qui est à côté, et on se réjouit d'avoir 
euh, que dans ce projet, il y a du commercial. Éventuellement, il pourrait avoir, euh, euh, les commerçants pourraient avoir là-bas pour nous permettre à nous faire un futur développement, sans entrer dans les détails. Mais de toute évidence, je vois ici que tout le monde peut y gagner. La ville va gagner dans les taxes, les résidents vont gagner dans la valeur de leur maison. Nous, en tant que communautaires, nous allons pouvoir continuer à faire grandir la, la vie de Côte-Saint-Luc et d'amener des résidents de qualité, des gens bien, des gens, puisque c'est un projet de luxe. On connaît la réputation de Claria qui a produit des excellents projets dans le passé, aussi bien maintenant qu'à Ville-Saint-Laurent et que partout ailleurs. Donc, nous, on, est, on, est, on a une très grande confiance dans ce qui se passe. Ça a été prouvé qu'il n'y a aucun problème de circulation et pas de souci au niveau de la sécurité. Dans ce contexte-là, j'applaudis vraiment l'équipe Claria, le conseil municipal, les, les, euh, tous les directeurs de la ville qui ont fait un travail depuis quatre ans, qui travaillent acharnément pour essayer de faire euh, résoudre ce problème. Et je crois qu'il y a un, su un support assez massif dans notre communauté pour ce projet. Et je vous remercie infiniment. Merci. Donc, pour résumer, vous êtes pour le projet et il n'y a ah, pas de questions. Non. <rire> les, les... Écoutez, je, les questions, je pense qu'il y a beaucoup de questions qui ont été répondues, mais définitivement, et j'ai beaucoup de gens que je représente qui ne sont pas nécessairement là ce soir, et on a vu quand on est venu la dernière fois pour l'axe Westminster au complet, c'était la salle était encore plus remplie que ce soir, et euh, c'était euh, quasiment unanime. Le, ce projet était extrêmement bien reçu, au-delà de tout le reste de Westminster, et je voudrais féliciter M. Kouchevski qui a, qui a travaillé très fort là-dessus. Et ça, il mérite que sa zone soit un peu revitalisée et embellie et tout l'axe Westminster. Et on est certain que tout ça, ça venait que du bien pour tout le monde. Il y a, nous, on ne voit absolument aucune négativité, que du positif. Et je suis heureux de que tout le monde collabore dans l'harmonie et dans le bien-être de nos citoyens et de nos enfants qui, évidemment, profiteront de toutes ces infrastructures. Merci beaucoup. Merci. On va passer à question 2. Whoever has question 2, please come to the microphone. Hi. So I don't think there's any question of if the Jack Vincelli land should be redeveloped. I mean, it's an empty field and it's been that way for four years, five years. Um, obviously, if you own the property next door, it's going to be a positive for you because one 12 story building leads to the next 12 story building leads to the next 14 story building. At the end of the day, how big is the shadow going to be of this building? And I do mean that literally. If it's a 140, 160 story building, how far is that going to block the sun in our yards or in the, in the front yards, all that stuff? So, um, our architect is here tonight and, and she can confirm what I'm going to say, but we have done many sun studies and it's, and, and you, can, you can probably see it behind. Uh, there is no shadow on the next door neighbors because because of the setback that I was talking about and the fact that the higher part of the building is along the railway. It, it doesn't bring any shadow to the townhouses. It's not near the townhouses. So it would not cross Mackle, it would not cross Westminster. You're no. saying the shadow is literally on the roofs of the lower story and the rail yards. Exactly. And if you look at the building, it's really, it's done in steps. So next to the, to the street, it's a lower level. And as you go back, it goes up. So it doesn't bring any shadow to any of the houses. Okay, and then I just have one follow-up question as well. I've been to the Equinox project. I think it's actually a very lovely building on the inside. It's always been a problem when I go to pick up a friend there for the visitor parking. That parking lot is a mess. And I can only imagine that's going to cause a huge stress to the streets. Why would you limit the visitor parking to 10 spaces for 244 units? Because it's, it's enough according to us and and we've studied that as well and uh there's enough parking on the street also and and as i mentioned before in terms of of uh street parking there's a very large uh supply right now 10 percent of the parking is uh, street parking is being used So, so that means that me living on one of the side streets next door, I should have visitors of this condo project parking in front of my house all the time. No, I, ten. You know, we have we have many buildings that that uh, we've built and and that we manage, and and usually it's it's around 10 to 20. Uh, how many are in the Equinox? Um, not sure about the Equinox. Not sure. I don't know if about 20. Anybody wow. else can answer? Yeah. So this is half that. Yep. That's it. So 
il y a une vingtaine de places. Le problème, c'est qu'il y a beaucoup de résidents qui ne veulent pas prendre le temps de descendre dans leur place. Why would that not be the same problem here? Alors, so we're trying to change the rule that we have to try to, that we, we have to do the same thing. Changing the rules to make sure that people don't, you know, go to their parking spots and leave the visitor parking for the visitors. But in theory, we have enough, more than enough. Just not in practice. That'll be okay. Because of people who don't follow the rules. But you're right, it's something we need to manage. So I just want to share something. We have a project in Ville Saint Laurent as well, Monarch, and uh, we delivered phase one last year. And there's actually a lot of the residents that were parking in the visitor parking outside, and the city came. And, and the city themselves asked the residents to park uh, in the indoor parking downstairs because these spots are for the guests. I, I understand that, but it seems like a recurring issue if it happened in Saint Laurent, happened at the Equinox. You're either relying on the city, but you're not fixing the problem, because it's obviously you're building it 244 units versus the 300 at the Equinox, and instead of 20 parking at the Equinox for visitors, you're only building 10 here. Can you it go back like to the microphone? The problem. Sorry. The, the, the people who will be watching this cannot hear you from your seat. <laughs> so if you want to continue, continue, but at the microphone. It, it, it seems like you're repeating the problem for Saint Laurent. If it happened in Saint Laurent, it happened at the Equinox where there's 20 visitor parking spots for 300 units. Here you're only building 10 visitor parking spots for 244 units. You're saying it's the city's job to fix the problem. You have to change the rules after. Here you're designing it from scratch. Why not add more visitor parking to solve the issue? No, I mean, we have, we have a manager on site that takes care of that, but she's not, she's not actually doing this job all day long. It, it, it could be a problem, but I mean, the tenants also have to be disciplined. The idea of adding more parking would take away from the landscape, would take away from the building. It, it brings, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but parking, uh, outdoor parking makes des îlots de chaleur, so it, it, it attracts heat into the area. So. But by not having it, it this takes away from the, the residents. This is not the way that we, that we want to build today with the environment. And, and, and so a solution would be if we have enough parking indoor to open the indoor parking for the guests as well. And we do that in certain buildings. Okay, thank you. Before you run away, could you state your name? Because we're taking notes. <laughs> David Clement. David Clement. Okay, thank you. Okay, whoever has question number three. Question number three. And please state your name, so I don't have to ask you to do it again after. Eric, S seems to me that it's kind of the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So just want to add that. Since we're also in the habit of, you know, speaking without actually asking questions, um, if we're changing the zoning in that area to allow for 12 plus stories, what's to stop someone else from building a 12 story in anyone here's backyard or the street next to them or someone throwing down a few houses selling to developers and then building up in that area so i do want to point that out um can i answer your question yeah sure so it's it's not a it's not like a a, a virus or a, a weeds that spread um we have a zoning bylaw and every time there is a zoning amendment it has to go through this entire process again. It doesn't just spring up. It has to fit in with the neighborhood. If this were in the middle of the neighborhood, it wouldn't have even come this far. It's at the edge. So it's not, it's not, there's not a proliferation of things like that. It doesn't, it doesn't function that way. We have rules. But the and strip on the other side of Westminster is the same zoning. Yeah. By the, map up the strip on the other side of Westminster. Where and the dry cleaner is. It's zoned commercial. It, no, but it's the same zoning as no, this one, right? No. no. Different totally different zone. Okay. Totally different zone. Anyways, my point still stands. He changes zoning here, he changes zoning there. It's, it's slippery slope. Another topic on the topic of parking. Um, I find it completely crazy how you have 10 spots, 10 visitor spots for that entire unit. Uh, there's a ton of new families and new uh, young families moving into the area, all with kids who all play on the street play hockey, basketball. So we are, if, if I'm understanding correctly, right now the, the street parking is underutilized. So now every single spot on the street is gonna be taken up by visitors to these units, to this building. And then what happens if there's an accident there with kids playing on the street, playing basketball? 
it's a completely ridiculous situation where a, a, a residential area, single family homes, to build a 12 story building is ridiculous. I was counting the number of stories um, of the buildings near here and they're all around the same height as those buildings. And to have that smack dab in the middle of a residential area is really not conducive to, as you say, a vibrant community life. It really isn't. Thank you. Number four. So I, j I just okay. want to mention okay. something. Michael and Westminster are actually uh, corridors, the corridor. So they're streets with traffic. There's, I don't believe there's many kids playing on these streets. Uh, Maybe. Uh, yes, but our project, uh, our project <laughs> is not influential. And you can talk to him, and maybe Eric can, can answer this, but uh, it, it, the studies have shown that we will not be impacting at all these streets because people coming out of our buildings, Sorry. well, I'm, I'm, it's, a prof it's a professional study, and we've actually made five traffic studies at the request of the city in, in four years. We've done and redone and added details to these studies, so we make sure that we cover absolutely every single angle. And, and I invite you to talk to our uh, engineer, and he'll explain it to you. And we have all the data, all the graphics, and you'll be able to see that this is scientific. It's not just words. OK, the next question, please. I think it was number four? Five. Four. Someone has it. Oh, OK. And would you please state your name? Forgive me. Call I me. am hard of hearing. And I didn't realize that in this particular room, I would have a larger problem. So if I'm being redundant, please say, we've heard it all. <laughs> my, my biggest problem is I've lived with my husband and I have lived at one house from the corner of Westminster and Mackle for 67 years. Um, it's my deepest concern, although I'm not thrilled with the drawings. I know the drawings are beautiful, but they really don't personify what the road really looks like. I, we're deeply concerned about the infrastructure. We know precisely that that infrastructure will never be able to hold the amount of traffic that the um, builders would like to see there the, with the community. Um, the road is narrow. It could never be widened. So if the city ever proposes putting up traffic lights, that is not going to that is not going to solve the problem. There's just the infrastructure on all those streets leading to there can never hold that amount of traffic safely, especially for young families. That's I think the most the biggest point I wanted to bring up. So I just want to clarify, when you say infrastructure, you mean the road capacity. Pardon? Not, when you say infrastructure, infrastructure, you mean the road. Mackle, Mackle Road. Right, the surface of the road. Not, and the, all right. the roads leading off. Have you ever, have you realistically ever stood on Westminster Avenue when the synagogue holds a simcha? Both sides of the roads are packed with cars from Mackle to, Kil to Kildare. Besides the fact that it overflows on Mackle too. It's not realistic to build that type of building in this particular. Maybe the area holds the building, but surrounding area cannot support them. There was no peace thought there. Sorry. Okay. Your comments are noted. Next. So if I may answer. Oh. oh. We need your name. Please. Would you mind stating your name? OK. OK. Your name. My name? June Adler. June Adler. OK, thank you very much. Tanya, can I, would, would I be able to answer this? Uh, there wasn't a question, but sure, if you want to make a comment to her comment. Yes. Where did this build? Where did this tree come from? 
Okay, that's a separate issue. Okay, you wanted to make a comment? Yes, I, I just want to mention that an, an event at the synagogue is, is really not the same reality on the street as... I really can tell you it's my fault, not yours. <laughs> okay. So an event at, the, at a synagogue on, on a single night it is not the same reality as 300 people living in a building and coming out at different times during the day and having indoor parking. Uh, and, and again, the studies that we've made, and, and five studies over five years, have, have shown that it would only bring an addition of 60 vehicles per hour on morning and evening rush hour. Not more than that. And these are professional studies. Yes, and I, I agree with you that on, on a holiday night... It's not holidays. It's, it's all... There's quite a Shabbat, even... Okay, in, even Shabbat. I mean, it's, it's normal that... It's not only the symbol, it's natural. Okay, I, I, we can't have this side debate going. Um, we have many other people in the room who have comments, so I would, I would like to... I just need you to reply to her. I understand. Okay, who has the next number? Go ahead and please state your name. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Isabel Rupp. Uh, it's a uh, nice design, a very nice looking project. I'm glad to hear that you did the traffic studies for uh, rush hour. Uh, my concern in particular is to do with that uh, because, of course, this is an enclave uh, and it is the most enclaved section of Côte St. Luke. And so my question would relate to whether or not the uh, extra 60 cars an hour was considered as an addition to all of the feeder traffic that has to go over the level crossing at Montreal West train station during rush hour, because that's already, uh, you know, a really bad situation as it is. And so unless the city has some solutions to de-enclave this section of Côte St. Luke or to improve access for that location to public transit with higher frequency and better connections to get people out of their cars, um, how is this going to impact that rush hour traffic, in particular over the level crossing at Westminster? So to just clarify your question, I just want to simplify the question to make sure we understood it properly. You want to know if the traffic study is extended all the way down Westminster to where? To Montreal a, West train I station. I want to say a, a point of, I want to say a hot point in terms of traffic. Yeah. Exactly. Go ahead. I will let the traffic engineer answer, but I just want to mention that the studies were not only for rush hour. The studies were general studies over a complete day. Yeah, understood. My concern is with rush hour. <laughs> well, uh, well, thank you very much for your question. Um, usually in a traffic impact study, we don't look as far as um, you, you, you uh, asked about the uh, ad cross grade, uh, ad grade crossing at uh, Montreal West. Usually we don't look as far as that because it becomes a total different issue and uh, it is already a total mess, that crossing uh, at, at that point. Um, another point is that you have many exit ways to the, uh, to the sector. I know it's a very enclave, but we have... One exit. You have, you have Westminster. And after Westminster, you have Côte Saint, Chemin de la Côte Saint Luc, and you can go eastbound uh, to take Cavendish, and then Fleet, and then other directions. So, and we we uh, we assess the uh, 
destinations from the people already um, uh, residing in the area where they go in terms of uh, traffic distribution. And you can talk, we can, you can come and talk to me, we can have a further discussion, but um, you can see how traffic can be um, uh, subdivised in many different directions. So yeah. the uh, great crossing at Montreal West is a total different issue. I know there were, there were projects many, many projects to uh, uh, improve that situation, but it's definitely not related with the uh, current project. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I would tend to disagree with you because I am one of a long line of cars going to work in Saint Laurent and in the West Island. So the problem of that area is that there is no egress to the south or the west. So it's literally, you're, I'm sitting in traffic behind the same car and the same car is behind me and the same car is behind them and behind them, behind them, to go to the Dorval Airport area, to go out to the industrial park in Saint Laurent, the uh, Dorval Industrial Park. So there's a significant amount of traffic that has to go south and west, right? And egress to the east uh, from Cote Saint Luc Boulevard and down Fleet is not an option for us, right? So this is the problem with this enclave, is that there's no way to get go west and there's no way, the only way to go west is you have to go south, right? So this is really a concern because all of that traffic is going down Westminster through the construction site in front of City Hall at Montreal West City Hall over the level crossing which is, has three commuter train lines running over it so that's a huge bottleneck and then we're all going down Rue Normand and going to pick up the 13 to go to Saint Laurent. So you know that's something I'd like to see addressed uh, as part of this project. But remember, there's only 300 cars in this building, and if we were to respect zoning, there would be half well. of those cars. So the project, uh, this is, it doesn't have a significant impact on what you're saying. It well, but that's what I'd like to know, because your traffic study didn't go that far, right? You only went as far as the local area for the one car a minute additional in, uh, in rush hour traffic. So how does it affect because you have all these other people feeding in from Western NDG and all, all going over Westminster trying to go west and south. I think this is a bigger Cote Saint Luke problem. It's not necessarily. <laughs> but this is going to add to that bigger Cote Saint Luke problem. Again, so I'd like to know what the okay, city is doing gonna about add, it. It's going to add. A okay. I have to cut off this parts. discussion. Your Thank comments you. are noted. The city has noted them. Thank you. Next. Was it six, seven? Six. Seven. I've lost track. Bonjour. Mon nom est Dan. Euh, And your je, name? Dan. 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 Okay. Moi, je suis intéressé. Est-ce que c'est juste pour poser des questions si on est contre le projet ou on peut aussi parler si on est intéressé au projet C'est ma première question. N'importe quelle question ou comment Moi, je n'ai pas de question. Moi, moi, je suis pour le projet. J'entends certaines personnes qui ont des, certaines craintes. J'ai grandi, moi, sur. Enfin, j'ai grandi. Ça fait 26 ans que je suis à Côte-Saint-Luc. Et j'habitais sur McLear, maintenant je suis sur Palmer. Et cette section de Côte-Saint-Luc, pour moi, elle est vraiment désert, désertique. Donc je trouve que c'est un super beau projet. Je ne vois pas comment une voiture par, euh, par minute va augmenter le trafic. Moi, je, tous les matins, je passe par là-bas et c'est vraiment vide. C'est comme mort, même désert. Donc je pense qu'avoir euh, plus d'appartements dans cette région, ça va rehausser notre, notre quartier, qui est le côté ouest de Côte-Saint-Luc. Qui est, euh, et en plus de ça, il euh, y a même une, une voie pour les, les cyclistes sur la rue Macol qui est très bien protégée. Donc je ne comprends pas pourquoi ça va déranger certaines personnes d'avoir euh, ce projet qui va vraiment embellir notre côté de Côte-Saint-Luc. D'accord, merci pour votre commentaire. La prochaine question. Next question, please. And please state your full name. <coughs> Mordecai Younger, um, long-time resident of Côte Saint Luc, living here for about uh, 44 years, uh, living four civic addresses from the projected project. Um, <coughs> uh, very, uh, I would like to, yours, when you presented yourself being altruistic, and uh, we definitely do appreciate it. I just don't think it has anything to do with the actual project. Um, we <clears throat> glossed over the actual setback on the project. We never heard what the setback is going to be from Mackle or Westminster. <clears throat> I find it kind of funny uh, 
having this project here when just about two years ago there was a project of a synagogue to be built on Mackle and there was a concern of parking. That was one building, one synagogue, and was voted down. <clears throat> Fast forward, you're putting up uh, this project. Uh, we glossed over the issue of retail stores on, on Mackle. There's no retail stores presently. Your projected project has retail stores. I believe there was, okay, even on Westminster. Um, we haven't really heard of exactly how many parking spots are going to be on their projected retail stores. <clears throat> we, there was a, I, I've heard rumors as well that the strip mall across the street will be torn down and there's a projected school to be built there, which I don't know if anyone has heard about it, but rumors are there. So there's presently a school on Westminster a new projected school, 284 or 240 odd, with 12 parking spots. Something doesn't jive when you, you, know, you say no to the synagogue being built, which is a fraction of the size of this project. <clears throat> and now you're talking about 240 projected apartments. <clears throat> as far as the shadows are concerned, unless you're building a transparent building, I live on four civic addresses for 44 years. The sun sets directly behind your project. Unless it's completely translucent, there is going to be a shadow in my backyard. When I bought into this home 44 years ago, I did not expect a 12 or 15 story building to be looking down on my backyard. And within a 10 block area going west, and a 10 block area going east, the maximum height is two to maximum three stories, except for the synagogue at Beth Zion, Bet Rambam, <clears throat> and then on Park Haven, where you've got the apartment building. Otherwise, every building within and V structure within 10 blocks is not more than three stories high. But this one is on for six. six. So or six. Let's double. let's double it. Six. I stand corrected. Six, and we didn't take into account that um, uh, Westminster is a dead end. So every car that comes into that area has to come out of that area. It's not as if it's a thoroughfare. Every car that goes in has to come out. You're at 285, <laughs> plus the school, plus the school, and plus a projected school, Plus the, plus the retail stores. Our underground parking entrance is okay. actually no, on no, the We have a moderated yeah. session. Yeah, Let but they've finish. got to go in, and they cannot go north on Westminster. They've got to come back. So your study is flawed in a certain sense where it's coming in and out. It's coming in and going out. Um, I'm just, yeah, so this is basically my concerns at this point. Okay, so I'm going to summarize what you've asked. So you want to know what the setbacks are on both Mac and Westminster. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You want to know what use, like which retail stores we're talking about. You want to know about the parking spots within the building, not so much the visitor ones, but the parking within the well, building. Well, <clears throat> both. For this. Um, you want to know about, there are rumors of a school. Um, I can answer that one right away, which is there is no project before us about the school. We have not received a formal project. We have received nothing. Mm -hmm. The same rumors you have, but okay. nothing has come forth. So yeah. um, in terms of shadows, you would like more in-depth information about the shadow stuff, I mean, which you can see. Sorry. Um, the, we're zoning. And you want to know about um, the dead end. So we'll start with the setbacks. In terms of the setbacks and what the <clears throat> retail uses are, can we talk about the setbacks on either street? Yes, so in terms of setback, I would invite you to talk to our architect, or you can answer maybe directly, Rana. Yes. And please try to speak into a microphone for the future viewers of this consultation. Okay, so good evening. Um, actually, the setbacks from Mackel and Westminster are 25 feet which is about 7.6 meters. 
which is what is, uh, what is regulated, what is by regulation. And uh, to the neighbors to the west, actually, the, to the townhouses, although the required is 19 feet, which is six meters, we've actually increased it to 18 meters, which is three times the setback, to actually allow for this uh, shadow study. And um, given the volumetric of the project, which I'm happy to discuss with you, the, the two-story and the four-story um, uh, height is, on, is to the west to actually allow for the shadows to miss the neighbors. So we have a two, four, and eight-story height building on that side. And this is how the shadow study goes back. <coughs> that was 12 stories. For the setback from the back, it's 15 One feet, second. which is 4.5 meters. So it's all by regulation, and it's actually increased on the west, as I said. Thank you. OK. So in terms of the uses for retail, <clears throat> what, what is? Uh, Carl, urban planner, would you want to talk about the uses for retail? And, and the, the retail is actually a, a request by the city. So, and... and <clears throat> Si vous me permettez, je vais répondre en français. Le retail est vraiment prévu pour être des services de proximité, pour aller en complément de ce que vous pouvez avoir à proximité. Euh, on voit des services bancaires, des nettoyeurs, fruiterie, vraiment des petits locaux. Il pourrait même y avoir des services professionnels comme un salon de coiffure. Donc, vraiment des plus petits locaux qui s'adressent autant aux résidents du, du projet qu'aux gens du secteur. Il n'y aura pas de de pharmacie ou de restaurant avec un service au volant. On parle vraiment plus de petits cafés. Euh, la liste des usages qui a été mis en place avec l'équipe de la Ville est quand même restrictive, très détaillée, et puis vraiment pour limiter les impacts sur le voisinage, mais aussi vraiment s'adresser à des gens qui vont pouvoir venir à pied et qui n'auront pas nécessairement besoin de prendre leur véhicule pour venir chercher une pinte de lait ou une banane qui manquerait pour le déjeuner du lendemain. L'idée, c'est de créer cet esprit-là de communauté, de pouvoir venir à pied au commerce. <clears throat> so your shadow question was answered, and then it's just the, the dead end question. Uh. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're also wondering how many parking spots were for the retail uh, stores, yeah, and if there were any. There, um, I'm assuming there's going to be people driving up to those stores as well. I don't think you're going to regulate the people walking or driving. Was there a number of parking spots that was uh, on the plans presented earlier for the retail? in the visitor's parking, and there's also a uh, un débarcadère on Westminster, Westminster side, and I believe that some city parkings also are going to be uh, on Westminster next to... to <coughs> so if I understand correctly, the, the people coming to the retail stores will be using the 12 parking spots that you're presently proposing as visitors. They'll be doubling up. For stores. And <clears throat> how are you going to control that? I mean, <laughs> how exactly are you going to control that? You're going to say you can't park there because you're not uh, going to a store, you're not going through. How do you, how do you control that? With 12 parking spots that are allocated to 240 apartments as visitors, and then you have a retail operation that cars will be coming go and going. Pour répondre à la question, ouais. je crois vraiment que l'idée va dans une, une occupation partagée de la, du stationnement pour visiteurs. Les visiteurs viennent le week-end nous visiter le soir, alors que les commerces, les gens qui viennent en auto pour acheter des trucs, ils viennent en fin de journée, ils viennent durant le jour, <coughs> ils vont au salon de coiffure durant le jour. La même case peut servir le jour, la semaine pour le salon de coiffure, la fin de semaine pour grand-maman qui vient visiter la petite famille. Donc vraiment, il y a cette cet esprit-là de partage des cases de stationnement, puis vraiment avec les études qu'on voit, puis on en fait plusieurs, des projets dans plusieurs municipalités, on parle toujours environ 5 de stationnement visiteur. C'est ce qui est proposé dans le projet, et on voit que l'occupation se fait de façon mixte et perméable dans le temps. Donc, ça, vraiment, en fonction de la planification, <coughs> on voit dans les projets récents, dans le fond, la planification est bien pensée autant pour les visiteurs résidentiels que les visiteurs des commerces. Yeah, I just find okay, that. I, I, okay, you've had a lot of time, okay. and there's a whole room full of people. So okay. I, I just want to, like, we, we have answered many of your questions. Let's move on to the next person. Thank you. Thank you. Suivant. 
I've lost track of the numbers, quite frankly. Seven, eight. Do you have a little paper that says? Because eight. Go ahead. And please state your full name. Thank yeah. you. Hi there. My name is Dave Lang. Um, I've been a resident of Cote St. Luke's since 1954. Been on Macalear that long. RU43 is the area. Over my lifetime, I've seen Cote St. Luke grow up. Um, and it's a beautiful city. And I think the people here who are putting up this building know what they're doing when it comes to designing a building. However, I think that it's a really bad idea to put it here in Cote St. Luke, especially there. Traffic is going to be the main problem. You can, you can try and cover it up with, with um, studies that have been done. Um, you can try and make excuses. But the fact remains that there are 240 odd cars extra that are going to be instantly added to this area. The infrastructure cannot handle the traffic as it is now. Um, Westminster is a disaster. I tried to go today. Well, it doesn't matter where I was trying to go. It took me a long time to get where I was going because of the bottleneck, certainly on Avon, where they're putting up a new building in Montreal West. But Westminster has always been a problem. Um, I don't know how, again, this has been said before, how 10 spaces um, for for guests is going to be tenable in any way whatsoever. Uh, when you come to um, you know, Jewish holidays, um, you will not be able to uh, handle the traffic that goes there. It's a problem already in many of the apartment buildings that are here now. Uh, my, mom's, my late mom's apartment building was one of those, and you know, when Hanukkah comes along and you want to park somewhere, there's just no way. You have to go up and down the streets looking for a place to park. Mackle's a pretty narrow street as well, as you know, um, and people were discussing the previous um, uh, project that was voted down. That was a much smaller project. Um, the, the parking there was already bad, and of course, it, it didn't make any sense. This does not make sense. Um, you know, I can go on and on here, but there's a lot of repetition. I think everyone knows that the major problem here is going to be the parking and the traffic. Um, you know, you were mentioning the fact that you were going to put retail space there. That retail space is going to attract a lot of extra traffic. People are going to try and park in the area. They're going to go all over the place trying to park. It's going to overflow into other streets. Um, and it's just going to create a terrible problem. I, I don't want to go on any more about this, but my major concern is the traffic uh, that is going to just increase the already miserable um, thing that we have to go through here as it is. And by the way, I have to say also, over the years, the city of Cote St. Luke has uh, put every impediment uh, possible on the streets to slow traffic down. We have speed bumps, we have narrowing street corners. Um, the traffic flow has gotten worse and worse over the years, and uh, it's for the safety of the kids. This is going to make everything much worse. Thank you. Come on, first and last yeah. name, please. Hi, my name is Danny Crew. I live on Rand Avenue for the last 22 years. Um, I'm not in favor of this project, not because of the building or the way it's set up, but because of its location. Um, we see a lot of traffic in the area right now. As was mentioned before, um, there are several synagogues in our area, and it's not just once a week, it could be several times, and it's in the mornings, it's in the afternoons. There are different <coughs> periods of time where the, uh, there, people have to park if they want to go to synagogue some, uh, during the week. Not, not talking about the Sabbath, not Shabbat, but we're talking about other times where there's... And adding 300 cars in, in that neighborhood, plus an, a, few, a huge influx of kids. We have at least 15 kids on Rand Avenue between, between Mackel and Kildare. And they're playing on the street. And I'm worried about the safety of the kids. Uh, and I'm worried about the increased traffic. People do speed on our streets. People are, um, are not, uh, you know, you know it, it, it's a situation that I think, uh, as, you know, as a city, we should think about that and not add more traffic into our area. The problem also, there's also a problem, it was mentioned that there are not so many kids, 
But there's a daycare right across the street from uh, at the corner of uh, I don't know what, the end of at the end of Westminster, and there are people that are going in and out there as well. And although you like to to term one car per minute, you know if you're behind 60 cars or you're behind 30 cars and you're trying to get not just we we, we can talk about all the way that your train tracks. But let's talk about Coatsing Luke Road. How many times does it extend at least 10 or 15 cars that we're waiting if you're, if you're trying to drive at 7.30 in the morning? It's, why should we add an extra, if we have an extra 10 minutes, an extra 10 cars? What, what is it in for, for the city, for the residents that, that are doing this? You know, the city has to look after its own residents and not just look after the developers. I know it's a nice project, but it's too big. It's too big for, for, for the neighborhood. There's no, no building that's 12 stories high that's close to that building. The, the whole area is, is low-rise low buildings. If they want to build it on Cavendish, it would fit in, but it doesn't fit in on, on, uh, in, in a residential area where it's low-rise uh, low uh, uh, buildings. And I feel it's wrong for the, for the area. And I, I feel that, that, that you want to encourage people to come into, the, into that area, Cote St. Luke, and there are a lot of young people that are coming into that area. Uh, you know, this could be, this could be something that people will, will, will look at and say, why would I go to a place where there's so much traffic? I, I, I'm not living in Cote St. Luke to live downtown Montreal. And that's what it's going to be. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for your comments. They are noted. Um, who is next? Nine. Nine. I think go it's ahead. my turn. Name, so, full name, please. Hi, I'm David Benarosh. I wish I could say that I, uh, I have been living in Cote St. Luke for 68 years or um, 70, I don't know what anymore, but uh, I'm a bit younger and it's only been uh, 30 years that I live in Cote St. Luke. Um, so I have some technical questions for the city and then some technical questions for the developer. Um, the first question uh, for the developer is, right now the zoning is for six stories and that's of right, correct? And right now, that zoning is, what is the zoning for the houses around the particular project? So, you know, if I'm looking at the map right in front of us, we're looking at the street Rand, for example, or McClear. Most of the houses there, they're, from what I understand, and you know, one floor, maximum two floors. Is that it? Yes. Single family homes. So Single the current family. zoning already approves for about three times more in terms of height than, than the surrounding houses, 300%. Um, and then there's definitely concerns about um, traffic, which have been responded, or parking. And I'm happy to hear that the developer is looking for solutions to, to accommodate parking. Um, I had a specific questions with regards to the development that happened on Equinox. Um, were there any increased traffic in Cote St. Luke, or did that create any sort of commotion in Cote St. Luke um, with drastic increased you know, park, uh, traffic problems? So I will put this question to our engineering department. Charles? So I'll respond to that. Um, much like this project, there were traffic studies uh, that were done prior to the issuance of that building permit and the approval of that project. And those studies showed that there would not be uh, a major increase to traffic on um, Kildare, Mark Chagall. And more importantly, they showed that there wouldn't be a problem vis-a-vis -vis the fluidity of the traffic at Kildare and Cavendish, for those folks to get out of the city. So uh, the studies were done and there was, there was, there was no problem flagged in the reports. And we haven't noticed as a department for the studies that we've commissioned thereafter to be any problems. So give or take, if I understand correctly, there was a building with similar height and similar amount of apartments that didn't create additional traffic as what's being proposed currently on Westminster. Correct. Um, 
so just to, so thank you for that answer. Um, over and beyond, I, I, I understand it's the trend to uh, kind of speak and everybody voice their personal concerns. So I'm, I'm gonna share uh, my own personal concern. Um, so growing up 30 years, I was actually a member uh, of the shul right across the project uh, up until I got married. And the reason I had to stop being a member of that shul was because there was nowhere to actually move around there if it wasn't in a home. Um, so I understand that some people that have been living in Cote St. Luke for many, many years um, with a lot more gray hair than me have certain concerns or are a bit scared about change. But as a youngster, if we may call it, in Cote St. Luke or a growing family in Cote St. Luke, if we want to live in that area, there's virtually no other option but to buy a home for those that can access it. Um, and for those reasons, you know, I really wish I could reintegrate that community, being in proximity to that community, taking into account definitely the traffic, you know, the parking spaces, but um, if I were able to find an apartment without having to live or walk 35 minutes, you know, on the other way of Cavendish to be close to my family, my, again, my community and my shul, it would be definitely greatly appreciated. Thank you. Who is next? I see your hand, but we have a we have an order. If there's a, a... What number was that? that was nine, nine? <laughs> ten. You were ten. Then I want eleven. If no one has number eleven, I feel like an auctioneer going for twelve. I'm sorry, I was eleven. You were eleven, so I need twelve. Does anybody have number twelve? Thirteen. Oh, you were twelve. Okay, come on. And please state your name when you get to the microphone. My full name. Your full name. I got it. Thanks. Rosemary Steinberg. I'm a resident of SMART for about f over 40 years. My question actually piggybacks on most other questions in terms of traffic, but it has to do with exiting Cote St. Luke. I've been here long enough to have been involved in two emergency situations where it was very difficult to get out of Cote St. Luke. There was the er, late, uh, the early 90s, I think, when there were the floods. 86. 87. July 14th, 1987. And then there was another one a couple of years ago. Now, I know that it's an, a, a very unusual occurrence, but nevertheless, there are only two exits in Cote St. Luke. There's Cavendish, there's Westminster. They both involve getting by tunnels or underpasses. As far as I know, Mitch, you could tell me I'm wrong. You've told me before I'm wrong, no problem. <laughs> but that's really my concern. I'm a mother and a grandmother who worries. If there is another emergency and there are another 300 cars in my area, how am I gonna get in or out to be safe? So my question is really for the, for the yes. city. It's not really for the... Uh, Developers. So I will address your question. The city of Cote St. Luke has an emergency preparedness plan and an emergency agreement with CP Yards. We actually have um, other exits in the city that we can't just access on a regular basis. At the end of Cavendish um, is one of them. So if you go to the end, if you were going to crash past Wallenberg, there are gates that open that should we have an emergency situation, we can evacuate that way. And there is another one behind Mount Sinai uh, Hospital to exit that way. So there, in fact, are other exits for emergency purposes, and we have emergency preparedness plans to do so and evacuate people should it be required. Two comments about that. Sure. Number one, does everybody know, and does everybody know the, the trajectory to go through? And second is the question is, how will an approximate 300 more cars, give or take, impact on that? So. After having done all these public consultations for the master plan, it is clear that we need to market our emergency preparedness better. Um, so we, we have um, a way of communicating when there are emergencies, but we will address this better with people because there's you're not the only one who's expressed concern about this. And in terms of this particular building exit, they are in fact next to the yards where they can get out. So these people won't impact inside Cote St. Luke, they would leave through the yards. Okay, thank with you. permission of CP. Yeah. 13? I was 13. Oh, you were 13. 14. 
How many numbers did you hand out? <laughs> I'm a 21. Oh, okay, so I need number 14. If there's no 14, I'll take 15. Whoever is the next person? Go ahead. <laughs> We're trying to be orderly about this. Go ahead. We Hi, can. my name is Carrie Pakovsky. I live on Hudson. Uh, I grew up on Blossom. I've lived in Cote St. Luke all my life. One of the questions that I have is that you've cleared it up until smart, I think, that what about all the traffic and cars from smart down to Blossom, where all those people live, it is horrendous on a good day, never mind, God forbid, an emergency. It is horrendous to get out of Cote St. Luke. We have two exits, two entrances, two exits, Westminster and Cavendish. If Cote St. Luke Road, it happened last year, there was a, an accident or something on Cote St. Luke Road, we were sitting on Westminster. We couldn't move. We couldn't back up. We couldn't turn around. We couldn't make a U-turn. We just sat there for an hour and a half waiting to get out. Now, another 300 cars added to that. Why are they not taking into consideration from smart to blossom? I'm sorry. I get it if you want to you know, stop it at Leger where they're going to go that way to get out. All these people still have to go. They want to go to the Cavendish. They're going to pass by on Kildare. They're going to pass me. They're going to pass on Mackle. Why is that not taken into consideration? Okay, any time. <laughs> no, it just, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to just for their traffic studies, but the, all of those streets are feeder streets to the collector that is Westminster. So the traffic that you did, all those cars that are counted, are counted from the area because they all feed into the collector that is Westminster, correct? Yes. Exactly. Okay, and sense. so why then are they not included in the referendum? Because they're going to be impacted as much as we are. That's, that's one question I would like to know. So I'm going to pass this to our urban planning. So I understand your concern for those people that you mentioned not being included in the referendum. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the way a referendum works is that people in contiguous zones from uh, the zoning plan are the ones who are eligible to, uh, to participate in the register. Uh, so unfortunately, it, it, it would have to be a tracing of the zones. Uh, like it's a tracing of the zones issue. It's, it's the way they're distributed. And unfortunately, like that, unless we which we are, we're, like we're, as part of the new master plan, uh, there, there could be new zone districts um, that, that, are, uh, that are redrawn, but for, for now, they're, that they're, they are the way they are, and to redraw them would add another referendum. It would have to go through the same procedure, so. Listen, it's a beautiful project. It doesn't belong here. You want to make townhouses that are low, that are two stories, that will bring in people <laughs> that will bring in families, actual fa you know, families with small kids that will have an area. I get it. They have townhouses there now. No problem. As far as the parking on Mackle, right now it's not an issue because there's nothing, th nothing there. So they don't need to worry. As soon as that building goes up, that mackle is going to be completely full. And it's a very narrow street, just like Westminster. It cannot handle any more parking. Right now it's empty. Oh, and there's a bicycle lane there. So you're gonna have one lane, a bicycle lane, and all this parking. It's danger, it's a danger to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Number 15. Although I know your name, state your name anyway. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Joy Klein. Um, I live with Danny Crew. He's my husband. We live on Rand. And, well, for a long time, Jack Bencelli was on the corner of our street. And it was a beautiful place. And it was a business where people came from Cote St. Luke and maybe some other places to do their shopping. And the area was kind of vibrant. And when Jack Bencelli sold, we understood that there was going to be a development, but we didn't understand that there was going to be a 12-story building that was going to come up on our street that attracted um, so many residents to that area without services for them or who would have to go away from that area. And 
I'm concerned about, as everybody, parking and traffic because I, th I think, I'm pretty sure that people will be parking on my street because I know if I have to go to an apartment or to a business, I'm looking for parking and I can never find any parking now because the cities are all over full with cars. So we really like our streets the way they are and the building that you proposed practically doubles most of the area that we have, like the population. If you look at my street, it's about 32 houses or 30 houses. So you're talking about 30, 60, 90, 90 houses on three blocks and you're putting in 240 residents, which is like overwhelming to what is there. And it doesn't attract the people who are around us, aside from your nice little garden which you've invited us to come to. There's nothing really attracting us to the area except for the little businesses. And it's not a green thing. Like you're having a green roof. I understand that you've made that accommodation with the green roof. But it takes away from the, the general milieu of what we're used to in that area of low buildings. And I think we could cope with six stories or even eight stories, but not 12 stories and not that type of building. And if you were having more, um, more things to attract people from the neighborhood, like, um, like youth centers or synagogue centers or school centers or daycare centers, which bring people in or uh, recreation centers, a, a gym included, like a, a basketball gym, not a, not, not a, a downstairs workout gym. I'm talking about a place where teens can gather because although we have a lot of beautiful facilities in Cote St. Luke, they're always being used and they're always very crowded. So this is an area where we have and we don't have that much spare area. So I was thinking, why, why couldn't you think of some project that would help us with the, the growth of our community instead of just adding in more people? And I know we want more people to be able to live in our community, but not in such a dense way. That's OK. Thank you. You were 16, right? So 17. If anybody else would like to ask a question, raise your hand. Bonjour, Laurence Huissa. Euh, j'ai écouté euh, beaucoup de commentaires et j'en ai, j'ai quelques commentaires et après j'ai finalisé avec une question. Euh, d'abord, j'ai l'impression et d'abord avec égard avec tout ce qui a été dit, c'est qu'on regarde l'enjeu, on regarde la problématique vraiment à travers euh, le trou de la serrure et on voit pas le problème global. Ça fait peut-être deux ans, au Québec, on parle que de crise de logement, que du crise de logement. Mais les gens qui habitent à Côte-Saint-Luc, ils savent que ça fait dix ans qu'on vit une crise de logement. Surtout pour les gens de notre génération, euh, c'est pas facile de trouver euh, une habitation. Il n'y a pas, il a, a pas d'offre. La demande est là, il n'y a pas d'offre. J'ai l'impression que on voit pas le problème comme il devrait l'être. C'est sûr que des places de parking ou un peu moins de soleil dans un pays où il y a un soleil de moins par année, ça, ça peut être important. Mais, mais pour moi, je trouve qu'on vit en crise de logement et ça fait très longtemps à Côte-Saint-Luc. Côte-Saint-Luc, c'est un quartier communautaire. Et pour beaucoup de personnes ici, des gens dans ma situation, on a grandi ici, nos parents sont là et on n'a pas d'autre option. On ne peut pas aller... Euh, je ne me verrai jamais aller vivre euh, à côté d'un DJ ou côté des neiges parce que j'ai grandi là, ma communauté est là. Et peu importe les prix des maisons, si la, si la maison elle est 3 millions, on va payer 3 millions parce qu'on doit habiter ici. Alors pour nous, c'est important pour la prochaine génération, pour la relève de Côte-Saint-Luc, de construire, de voir des projets comme ça. Euh, je ne suis pas arpenteur ou je ne connais pas les trafics et tout ça. Moi, ce que je connais, c'est la fiscalité. Et hier, le budget du gouvernement du Québec est sorti. 
Et tout ce que tout le monde avait sur le bout des lèvres, ce qu'on voyait dans les journaux, ce que la mairesse Valérie Plante n'a pas arrêté de dire, c'est qu'il n'y a rien sur le logement. Il n'y a rien. Dans le budget, zéro. J'ai eu toute la journée aujourd'hui. On n'a rien sur le logement. Aujourd'hui, j'écoute, j'ai l'impression qu'on a une belle occasion pour la ville de Côte-Saint-Luc de réparer le tort du gouvernement de Québec, proposer un projet. Et pour moi, pour moi c'est quelque chose qu'on devrait vraiment envisager. Et dernièrement, euh, Côte-Saint-Luc, l'état des, 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 des propriétés des immeubles, c'est très vieux. J'ai acheté ici. Tous les huit mois, je me fais frapper par un assessment. Toutes mes économies sont grugées. Voir un projet neuf où il n'y aura pas d'assessment pendant longtemps, c'est quelque chose que moi, je pourrais envisager d'acheter. Alors, ma question, c'est quand qu'on pourrait acheter sur plan. Okay. Numéro 18, number 18. Full name, please. Hi, my name is uh, Dan Solomon, and my question, my first question is to the city. Did the city do a traffic study, an independent traffic study, or are you relying on the developer study? The city did not do an independent traffic study. I'm sorry? The city did not do an independent okay. traffic study. Does the city not think that the, uh, an independent study is required because it looks like a lot of people are concerned about the traffic, not to mention that in the mornings when you go into fleet, there is a backup on Cavendish already. There is a backup for Cots and Luke Road. There is a backup on Westminster. And yet the city did not think that it was important enough to, to, make a, to do a study, an independent study. The studies are performed by traffic engineers who are governed by an order. And we have our own in-house engineers in the department um, that is here at City Hall. They, their role is to analyze the data that's been provided in these reports and pronounce on these. And we have no reason to believe that you know, there was anything incorrect or wrong with these studies. And up until now, we don't feel like we need to uh, commission our own independent study in this particular case. With all, your, with, with all your respect, if you have 233 units in an average of two people living in there, you're looking at 450 to 500 people with two cars. In some cases, you're going to have two cars, which they don't have room for in, in the underground parking. And yet, the numbers that were being told that it's only 60 cars an hour. It, the numbers just don't jive. I'm, I'm sorry to say that. The other thing is the question of the shadow. The sun is moving exactly behind the building in the summer. From May to September, it sets behind, behind the building. A 12-story building will take, the shadow, uh, will, will take the sun away from the people in the front of the building. And it's not just in front, because you're going to have to make the angle at which the, the sun sh uh, shines towards the, the houses is going to be all that area that you see, RU42 and RU43, half of it, half of it is going to be uh, on, on, without sun after 1 or 2 o'clock in, in the afternoon. The other thing uh, is, I, I don't know how many of you were here in, in 1987, when the flood struck and Cavendish underpass was underwater for three days. The only exit at the time was Westminster, and I understand that you mentioned that there are two or three exits, but you have 35,000, 40,000 people. You're surrounded by railways, and they're carrying oil tanks. Anything happens, you're going to have a big problem getting 40,000 people in three or four exits. I don't know how, how the, the plan was done, but it does, again, it doesn't make sense to me. And... Uh, you had a so, speak. Let us okay, okay. You, you have your opinion, please, and we, please, I respect it. This conversation, so please. continue, continue. I would not like comments. Okay. Other people got a chance to speak. So, please continue. To the city, there are a lot of red flags with this project, and I'm not against your project. 
but the red flags, there's concerns certainly about the traffic. Your traffic study, I'm questioning that 100%. I, don't, I know that it's an engineer, I know he's a member of the Order of Engineer, but I'm telling you that the study is flawed. And people, I don't see, I see a benefit for the city by having a million dollars extra in tax, I see a benefit for the developer, but the people in RU42 and RU43 have no benefit whatsoever on this project. Thank you. Number 19. Steven Seabag. Good evening. Um, I, I would like to you know, put in a few comments and then finish with a question. Obviously, more and more people come up here and speak, and I mean, most comments are about traffic. So I like reading, and I'm not an engineer, I'm not an architect, but I see a lot of cities, Rosemont, Montreal West, I mean, all, of the, all the other boroughs are actually dropping their parking requirements to 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.25. I don't understand why Code St. Luke is still at 1.25. I mean, I, this is like bylaws of years ago. As a matter of fact, there was a study done in Toronto that I don't believe is flawed that is starting to impose on developers a maximum number of units, maximum number of parking lots. They do not want cars. They do not want parking. So that for me, points to one truth and one truth only, is that the, the conscious of car sharing, public transportation, uh, bicycle, et cetera, even though here in winter it's a little harder, um, point into one direction, is that the need for car and parking is dropping tremendously and therefore directly uh, impacting the traffic flow. Uh, second of all, um, I'm not a professional, and I don't, I don't mean to speak as a professional. However, when a professional gives his opinion, he is backed by years of education and studies. I, I've never seen anybody go to a doctor and get an ordinance and say, I, I don't agree with it, or go to, a, I don't know, go to an accountant and say, I, I don't agree with it. So I don't understand why we're opposing studies. So I, I frankly don't, I, I hear their concern, and their concerns are true. However, they become not true the second a professional puts his stamp on it. Now, we might question the integrity of this professional, it's your right, but I have a hard time to believe that a professional will put his career on the line for one traffic study, uh, unless he owns 90% of the project and has much more to benefit from. That's my two cents. Now, getting into a little, a little bit more technicality, um, first of all, I myself and my family have had uh, direct relatives who would like to live in Cote St. Luke to the Mr. Suisse's point. Uh, they could not afford the house for two, three years. They're contemplating, uh, they contemplated on leaving and going to Ville saint -Rome, talking two, three, four large families who are the future of Cote St. Luke, and they ended up renting on Park Haven until they bought recently, before the interest rate hike, thank God. Um, so that's another point. Now, I hear a lot of people opposing to this project, but I don't hear any pertinent or good project proposal being proposed, aside from townhouses, which is a great idea, but again, to Mr. Suisa's point, is unaffordable. So again, we're catering to the rich and people who retire and come live here. So the, the question should be towards the city, what is your vision? Do you want to bring old, rich, retired people here, which is good, which will not contribute to the future of this community? Or do you want to attract young, vibrant people who will live here, work here, play here? So Mike, somebody, somebody, somebody came up here before, I don't recall who it was, and said on, on their street you had 90 cars, 90 houses. 90 houses, the average of cars per house is about two. That's 180 cars. Over there, you have 240 units. Units, by definition, are about one per car. So we're talking 180 versus 240. That's one. 
Number two is that if you have, as of right, six floors, I'm not an architect, but you can probably fit in there about 180 units. So the real question is from 180 units to 240, this is your real delta that we should really be analyzing. People come up here and talk about 300 people and 300 cars. That's not true. That's not true because none of us would have a voice. None of us would have the right to come speak if these developers would do it as of right, put 100 car in, 180 cars in your face, and you would be stuck with it and nothing to say. So my question is for the city, what are you going to do to address the 12 or 15 spots that are a concern to the citizens, which is a real concern, but I think this is where the real question lies, is not how the developers are doing their projects, because they're doing by the bylaws, backed by the urbanists, backed by studies. The question should be, on the ground, how is the city going to go ahead and protect those 15 or whatever spots for visitors? And I think this is really where the whole conversation of a whole project is on the city coming and giving tickets on that. Thank you very much. Okay, so on the, on the question, well, you mentioned parking ratios, that our parking ratios are definitely under scrutiny. Um, this is one of the things we're looking at for our master plan process because we have one of the highest parking ratios pretty much on the island of Montreal. Um, in terms of the visitor parking, we, are, we have noted all the concerns um, of the people and we're going to have to analyze it. There, there's nothing further to say about that than that. I can't give you an answer right now. I don't want to give you anything wrong. Um, I'd rather we have a discussion and then we can post answers on our website. Um, number 20. You're 21, you're 20. Go ahead. I will state my name because most of you know me. My name is Mark Binman. Yeah. Um, I want to comment on a few things that I've heard tonight. First off, um, this is a beautiful project, architecturally, visually, it looks nice. Unfortunately, I don't think it's in the right place. It changes the character of the neighborhood. Uh, I've lived here for 40 years. Most people have lived here longer than me. I, I could live with something lower rise. It doesn't have to be townhouses, it could be a little bit more. People here are talking about affordable housing. This is not a, a, a condo project, it's a rental project. So it doesn't change the ability of people to buy houses and the affordability of houses in, in the Coast St. Luke area. It, it gives you the, the, the possibility to live here and pay the rents. Um, you talk about commercial space there. There's a strip center across the street that has only two stores occupied at the moment. I believe this gentleman mentioned that he represents Yavne, yep. and Yavne owns that strip center now. Correct. I don't know that Yavne is in the real estate business or in the commercial re rental business. So yes, the city said there's no project for a school there, but I have to believe that somewhere in the back of their minds when they bought this strip, strip center and this piece of land, there's got to be a school in, in, in mind against uh, uh, next to a project with 200, I hear, keep hearing different numbers, 244, whatever. There's traffic there. I also want to remind people of 1984 when the Pope came to visit and, and the whole, both Cavendish and Westminster underpasses were closed because the Pope's train was coming along there. I remind you about 1987 when the underpasses flooded and Westminster flooded also. Cavendish may have been closed longer, but they were both closed for a while. You have a railway yard there. Who knows what? We know that there's hazardous materials going through there. God forbid we should have another disaster. You now got 300 more uh, uh, units. Plus, in, in the master plan process, they're talking about redeveloping part of the Cavendish Mall site again also. People talked about an enclave. Yes, we're an enclave. And we have two, basically two exits out of here. Adding all of this, I don't think it's the right place. Like I said, I think architecturally it looks like a nice uh, project. 60 cars an hour, that's an average. You still, we also do not have good public transportation. We're not near the rim. We're not near the, the commuter train. We have no metro. All you've got is a couple of bus routes. Not everybody is going to uh, have cars and have the ability to, to add 300 more units on such a small space at a dead-end street, whatever cars there are. 
That's it. Thank you. So I just want to comment on two of the things you've said, because so many people have mentioned the flooding of the underpasses. We have um, now, we have pump stations at every single underpass, which literally, if the water would, like, it would, it would literally drain the water as it would accumulate, so it wouldn't accumulate. So we didn't have them in 1987, as far as I know. Um, so the underpasses will not flood. We check on these, they're functional, they work. Um, and, and at the level crossings also. So please, um, I don't want people to be like, oh, we're trapped. It, it, it's really, we're not, we're not. Um, and, and also to your comment, the fact that we're poorly served by public transit is a major preoccupation of the city of Cote St. Luke, a situation which we are trying to, and pushing aggressively to rectify. Um, who is next, number 22? Hi, uh, my name is Ravia Haziza. Uh, so I heard a lot of people talking about Equinox. I am actually a resident of Equinox. Uh, I got married last year, and when I got married, there was absolutely nowhere for me to move <laughs> in Cote St. Luke, except for a 30 minute, 35 minute walk from my parents' house, which is not the best thing, honestly. And um, so they spoke about the parking of Equinox. I think I could speak about the parking at Equinox, I live there. Uh, the second floor of the parking is basically empty. <laughs> so if you drive there, even at night, you will see the second floor of the parking empty because I'm assuming there's at least one space per condo and it's still not full. So I guess we could see that there's not that many cars as everybody's talking about. Also, I leave at 7.30 every morning, I'm a student and there is no traffic leaving the building. I see maybe one car, maybe two cars in the morning. My husband leaves right after me. About the same thing, and I live around five buildings, resident areas, a school, and there's no traffic. <laughs> I'm saying there's a school, I have to pass by the school. Obviously, like anywhere you live, you have to wait a bit, which is normal. It's rush hour, that's why it's called rush hour. Um, but I wouldn't say that, I personally, I don't think in a dead end, like everybody is talking about, a, a project like that, it would just be beneficial. I'm saying for me, especially as David Chai put it, a youngster of the community who's looking to build a family here, we need options. The interest rates are so high, there's no option for us to buy. Where do you want us to go? So... A project like this is beneficial. And my question to the city is, what are you going to do about that? As young people of the community, we need somewhere to go. We want to stay here. We want to build a community in Cote St. Luke. We don't want to leave. But if you don't give us those options, we have no other option but to leave. And if you ask me, you already have a sixth floor available. Adding it, six more floors won't really make a difference. I live in the building of Equinox, where we have like, I don't know, 13 floors? Not sure how many floors are, whatever. And there's two buildings. And the parking is basically empty. So I don't think parking, also for visitors, like I, I've seen the visitors parking. It's always empty. It is always empty. The only time it is full is when there's an event because they have a very nice hall. And so when there are events, yeah, it is full, but okay, like once every, I don't know, month, which doesn't really bother. As a resident of that building, I park inside the building. I don't have any problems when I leave in the morning. I'm saying Coats and Luke Road for sure, but I think that's a city issue, not a developer's issue. So I really vote for this project. Thank you for your comment. In terms of, um, we are absolutely looking at housing availability and affordability as part of the master plan process. We are aware that this is a major issue, and so we are looking to address it. Um, who is next? 23? <clears throat> Just a follow up, uh, some follow up questions. Are there people who haven't asked a question yet, but we I have asked. a second That's set of questions? That's what I asked. Okay, no, there's, there is a person who hasn't had a question yet. So let's get through everyone first. Okay. Yeah, sure. Let's get my door. And we also have um, five minutes left for this consultation. So. Hi, so my name is Laurent Ziri. I've been a resident here for about four years also. Um, I don't want to rehash what's been said because uh, a lot of things have been said and reset. 
since the building of the Equinox, there hasn't been a huge increase in traffic. I work in DDO every day. So I go in back and forth and go back up with my kids at 4 o'clock during rush hour. Sometimes I take the 20 and sometimes I take the 40. Just put your ways and they'll figure out the best way. It's not always going through there. So I don't see that there's been such a big increase with other projects that have been in Cote St. Lucas. We say this is not the right site, but then we talk about traffic. So if we do it on another site, traffic going out of Cote St. Lucas, knowing that there's only two exits, would be the same. Plus, I think that the points that have been raised, you have to look at the differential because if they want to build in their own right, there's only 60 more apartments that are going to be built. Plus, the biggest point that hasn't been really addressed by people that have been living here for 40, 60 years is that there's a lot of young couples that want to live here. There's a human aspect to this community. I grew up here. I played hockey in the streets. I was the guy with the basketball running in front of cars. So I know what it is also. But we need to cater to this young community that wants to create vibrant uh, community, vibrant uh, Cote St. Luke, and bring back what it is. This whole area with Vincenzi has been desert for a few years. It's not pretty to live in. I have friends that live in that area that would welcome this kind of development. So I think that also we have to think about the whole community as a whole and grow the community to where we need to go. I mean, it's a vibrant community. I love living here. I wouldn't live anywhere else. But we have to think also about these younger couples that are looking to come and join the community and be part of us. So that was my comment. So we have time for one more question. Is there anybody who has not asked a question or made a comment yet? And if so, we can, you can come back. Um, and then after we will close it, the developers will be around for a little while after if you want to ask them questions. I've got a number. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I've got a number. You're at the podium. Yeah, we've got to work with numbers, right? Okay, we, we have limited time. Yeah. Um, I was actually quite taken aback <clears throat> for that. Um, the, I didn't quite expect our developers to come here and say that you're going to be increasing traffic. <clears throat> I didn't expect them to come and say that... Uh, you know, there's going to be less, there's going to be more sunshine or, or less sunshine. And what I'm actually taken aback by, by, you said that the city has not done their own independent research on what a developer is telling you. That doesn't make sense to me. <clears throat> vis a vis, um, I'd like to ask the developers the average rent per apartment. Construction costs today are astronomical. There's a lot of young couples saying that they want affordable housing. You could probably rent a home less expensive than what you're going to be projecting on your projects. <clears throat> because rents will go from eighteen to $3,600 a month, if I'm not mistaken, seeing, being a developer. So your average young couple, I'm very sorry, that's not going to be affordable housing for you. So why isn't, the question is, why isn't the city doing their own independent study? vis-a-vis -vis listening to very nice, glossy, you know, portrayal of what their studies are going to be, number one. Uh, this question was already answered. Yeah, I, but... I, we already answered this question. We're not answering it. But I was saying uh, it's outstanding that okay. <clears throat> a city does not do their own independent study and listens to a developer who has a, pro a direct interest in putting up that project. As our city engineer has said, they have reviewed the studies, and they regard them as legitimate. It's like giving the keys to a prisoner, you know, when such is, such it, is it doesn't opinion. make sense. <laughs> All right, so it is 9 o'clock. I would like to thank everybody for coming. It is... Can we find out what the rent is going to be? Oh. Uh, if you can answer that question quickly. Yes, I will. First of all, you know that, <clears throat> I don't know if you know, but construction costs are actually going down again <clears throat> and, and are back to 2019, 2020 rates. So they have, they have gone up, they're back down. Uh, rents, we haven't established our rents yet, but I can tell you that we always do market studies and rents are the average of what they are in the area of Cote St. Luke, so it will not be higher than what the area already shows. Okay, so on that, no. And I'm gonna just add just one more thing, just in terms of rent, per se. Um, so the equinox, let's take the equinox as an example. 
is uh, at least a good 10 to 15 cents per square foot cheaper than anywhere else on the island of Montreal in terms of similar projects. Uh, and we have similar projects in Saint Laurent that are even more expensive. Average, right? Average. But so again, it's a per square foot. I mean, you seem like a very smart individual, so you, you do the math. So, and, and just to add on again to that, this is not a social housing project. This is not an affordable housing project. This is a luxury project. This but it is might not be an affordable project as well for young couples that they claim it's going to be. Uh, again, so. Than buying a house. Okay, we're not having a dialogue back and forth. He's answering what he's answering, and then we are closing up. Please go ahead. Are you finished? Okay. So I want to thank everybody for coming. It is impressive that we have such engagement from our residents. Uh, merci d'être venu. C'est fortement apprécié. Um, this will be, this has been recorded and it will be posted. If people um, couldn't make it or they have further comments, they can write consultation at CodeStLuke.org for any other comments or questions. Thank you very much. The developers will be around if you have more questions.